Well, hello and welcome to another recording of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. We are back with more news, tech content and wisdom from the world of marketing. Joining me, a man on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the Marketing Finance Podcast and the host of the Rogerlog video series, I give you Monsieur Roger Edwards. No, oh, thank you so much. And of course, my co-host is also a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing. He's the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. Please welcome Monsieur Pascal <laughs> Fintoni. Thank you very much, Roger. This is episode 64, and we are days away from saying goodbye to January, which is always a tricky month, isn't it? Yeah, I believe that last Monday is is actually known as Blue Monday, not to be confused with the record by New Order from the 80s. But yeah, apparently it's one of the hardest days of the year because people are just having to come to terms with the year ahead after the Christmas break. Trust Roger to always manage to put some musical <laughs> reference in, in, in this podcast. Yeah, so we're going to do our very best to provide light, light entertainment and, you know, some kind of knowledge and wisdom you can take away to apply to your own marketing endeavors. Before we do so and move on to a quick highlight of what we have in mind for you, I want to welcome a new YouTube subscriber, Dan Hodgson from York, the Managing Director of Pro Arm Sports, joined us as well. And what I thought we might do actually next week, Roger, is do a big, big recap on all the different subscribers to the YouTube channel because, of course, it's easier to tr keep track. But uh, if you are a podcast listener, just come and say hi, and they will give you a quick name check as well. We also, in our attempt, Roger, to bring light entertainment, as I mentioned a moment ago, we released our 2021 special uh, bloopers or outtakes a few days ago, and it's been well received. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you watch it back, it's it's both funny and cringeworthy at the same time, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and fortunately, um, our video editor, Tim, was very good at putting in the bleeps because, uh, my goodness, I was swearing quite a lot when I was messing up. Likewise, although my, I used to swear in French, it probably sounds all right when I, when I, when I do so. <laughs> but I, I would use this opportunity to say a quick hello to uh, people who have reacted to the to the bloopers, but also have been kind of big supporters. So I'm thinking of Joanne de Lazale, Eric Purdy, Eileen Murphy, Claire Jank, Simon Clayton, Joe Long, Justin Messenger, Kirsty Bartholomew, Natalie Emony, Jeff Nicholson, Richard Dawson, Andy Turner, and Turner, not related. Alex Curtis, Pete Everett, and so many more. We are pretty much you know, entering our second year of producing Two Geeks in a Marketing Podcast. And knowing those individuals and more who are reacting, enjoying it, sharing, commenting, uh, it just makes a huge difference. Absolutely, yeah. So thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. So quickly, we want to go through our usual segments, looking at news, looking at content spotlights, tech, looking to the recent and distant past. But we also have a very special selection for film marketing, Roger. Absolutely right. And I watched this last night. I often do watch the films the night before we record, especially if I've not seen them for a while. And I can't wait to talk about Dog Soldiers. Yes, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of Dog Soldiers. I remember vividly going to the cinema in uh, Newcastle to go and see this. And it's just a treat, and I can wait for the DVD to come out, and we're going to have a great chat about a, the production and you know, this lesson in terms of um, indie filmmaking, but also the, the marketing that came out of it. But let's begin, as we always do with Two Gigs and Marketing Podcast, with In The News. A new report from Accenture titled Why Shopping is Set for a Social Revolution claims that the global social commerce industry is expected to grow from $492 billion in 2021 to $1.2 trillion by 2025. Wow. Well, Microsoft is finally launching its walkie-talkie feature of Microsoft Teams across tablets and mobile phones to let users turn smartphones into a, well, walkie-talkie to that works over Wi-Fi and network data. Clubhouse is adding a new share functions and is experimenting with web listening in the US, allowing anyone to listen to a Clubhouse room without downloading the app. Okay, well, according to a recent survey by eConsultancy.com, the main drivers for customer experience this year are sustainability, inclusion, privacy, user centricity, video, automation, empathy, and trust. According to a research study by TikTok, 9 out of 10 users view sound as being vital to their TikTok experience. 
Unlike other platforms like Facebook, who recommend that brands create sound off content. Twitter wants to position itself as a prime location for studios and advertisers to reach their audience thanks to the, to the dedicated at Twitter movies and at Twitter TV accounts with millions of followers. Channel 4 and Heinz are launching a new cookery show featuring comedians and a talking microwave. The five-part series of Flex Kitchen will run across Channel 4 social media channels. Well, listen to this. Oreo took over the last standing blockbuster to promote the return of the Cakesters snack. The video store was outfitted to transport consumers back to 2007, who sampled the cakes in packaging inspired by VHS cases. Interesting stuff. So lots of reports, lots of partnership and so on. I want to take you back to the very first news item that you read. This report from Accenture, this idea of uh, social shopping or social commerce that is going to literally, I would argue, almost triple in the space of three to four years. And I want to link that to Clubhouse as well. This idea of social media starting as a platform to provide a way to socialize with people that are known to you, and of course then grow in not that beyond. And I'm wondering whether the, the term social media is just losing is true origin and we almost need to reevaluate because on one hand you've got now all the platform becoming essentially e-commerce platforms so it's no longer the social networking and they had clubhouse as well roger who made a, the headlines by saying we are so different so unique because the only way you can listen and join is to be invited you have to have the app and so on and now here they are allowing people to listen to a room without even um, downloading the app and i'm wondering whether it's just the way it is you know that's part of progress or are we just losing the real let me use a french term raison d'etre of those platform is becoming a bit of a mess yeah uh, the, the first thing that i thought about when the when i read the clubhouse thing out was if you well, if you haven't got the app how can you listen to it but presumably they mean on a browser or something like that and this whole idea of shopping and a social revolution are we just saying there that people can buy things via Twitter and people can sure. buy things via Facebook. I think, again, we, we've said many, many times on the on the Two Geeks um, show that there seems to be this predilection from many companies to be exactly the same as everybody else. And isn't one of the main reasons for being in business to stand out from your competitors, to do different things to your competitors? If you're the same, then always then comes down to things like price or convenience which which people will choose between so again i i get a bit nervous when everybody just seems to be heading in exactly the same direction you think for goodness sake do something different and for me it's this idea of we work you and i in marketing you know we support the activities of a close cousin which would be sales and customer service I don't have an issue if someone would say this is a social network and there will be no means to shop, there will be no means to advertise. It is for individuals to keep in touch with each other. And I'm just I am aware that, you know, all the platform, including Pinterest Pinterest that was mentioned in the news section, need to raise uh, make revenue. They need to satisfy the needs of the shareholders and so on. But if ultimately the, the, the platforms you know, from Facebook and all the others become a shopping outlet, albeit a digital one, then they shouldn't be surprised if people eventually go, you know, that's not what I signed up for. Mm. Uh, granted, you know, it was many years ago and everything, everything changed and no, nothing stays the same. But it just feels, whilst I have sympathy and I will be the first one to encourage my customers to explore social media as one of the many ways in which you can engage, not enrage, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so on. I, I'm just perplexed as to why suddenly, um, do you remember back in the one industry that you and I mentioned, not travel industry, when airports became completely kind of slammed by being shopping malls with runways. Yes. And and, that, and there was a rebellion if you like, from the public and from um, even the, the, the industry as a whole. I wonder whether this is what's going to happen. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm torn between thinking, great, that's going to help many, many small businesses, but in the other, will essentially the audience go, I've had enough, I'm out. Yeah, and maybe it's an opportunity for somebody else to go back and reinvent a pure social media channel. 
Indeed, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it happens. Uh, on that very point, you know that um, Google has had for many years now. They've claimed that Google Maps will become a social network. Maybe that's uh, what they've been waiting for. Then I want to take you back to the to the very last two news item. Quite kind of humorous in their own ways, but it's all about partnership. You've got Channel 4 and Heinz. I would love to see what the talking microwave is going to look like. And they've got Oreo and the last standing blockbusters. And this idea is working together to create, again, a, an experience. One is obviously digital, and the other one is obviously in person. And I do wonder whether on occasion businesses, you know, should take a hint about this partnership approach. Yeah, I mean, it's collaboration, isn't it? I, I mean, is, it's interesting that the Channel 4 and Heinz thing, presumably Heinz are sponsoring this particular show as opposed to being the joint producers. I don't know, and I, I would need to go into a little bit more detail. So on that one hand, it, it seems to me that you've got media companies on one side and in these, these two examples, food producers on the other coming together to create content which presumably is just going to end up promoting the Heinz brand and the Oreo brand so I've, I've not really got much of a problem with that because it's it's just an, a, a way of sponsoring content and it's a way of getting a message out there um, but again it, it's it's that element of is it really creative is it really for the customer or is it just um, another excuse. Oh, absolutely. Um, what I found fascinating is Channel 4 has made the decision to only publish those on, on social media channels, you know, which mm -hmm. um, we know what that will be. So again, this idea of reflecting on what can we do to a, um, do something interesting on social media and not always thinking that it's just down to you. You could partner up, but also making the clear decision. This will not go on main TV, you know, it will be just on the social networks, which I think I think it's um, just interesting that people are doing those kind of very, I would call the mini campaigns, you know, very focused, very tight. It's only a five part series of Flex Kitchen, so maybe that is just going to be that. And I just like the idea of once again you you and I choosing those news items as a source of inspiration for mm -hmm. our viewers and listeners to go. And what was the last time we collaborate with anybody? When was the last time we did something that was maybe short in terms of the many, many parts? And also, when was the last time we actually just selected a channel of communication, which could be print, which could be you know anything else, to see um, what we can do to engage, engage the audience? Great. Well, listen, I was very tempted to ask you for the other news items. We've got quite a lot of content to go through. In particular, our next segment, the content spotlights. Now, I know this is one of Roger's preferred segments where we surprise each other with a discovery from the interweb, an article, a podcast, a video. So, Roger, what did you bring to the table this week? This is an article, Pascal, and it's a sort of follow-up article to the one that I did last week. This appeared in or appeared on Fast Company, and it's written by Mark Wilson. And the heading is The Seven Most Overhyped Trends of 2022. And the byline, and this will make you laugh, the byline is, we're looking at you, NFTs. <laughs> and of oh, course, wow. last, week, last <laughs> week I had a bit of a rant about NFTs. Now, obviously, at this time of year, at the beginning of the year, there is an absolute flurry of what I call pre marketing predictions articles. And those marketing predictions articles always talk about the new toys. So you need to do this to boost your SEO, or you need to do this to boost your email, you need to adopt this new application form to build your brand, blah, blah, blah. And, and quite a lot of those predictions always revolve around tactics you know you never hear people talking about one of the trends of 2022 will be more customer research or one of the trends of 2022 will be better product development no it's always about those hyped shiny toys and again it made me laugh and mark's gone through a few things and i will very quickly take you through the hyped trends that he's um, talking about. So the first thing is the metaverse. Now, we have heard so much about the metaverse over the last 
six months or so, possibly prompted by Facebook rebranding themselves as Meta. And this is their attempt to almost like grab the Metaverse and, and almost claim ownership of it. But what Mark is saying is, look, the Metaverse is probably going to be the next iteration of the internet. But think back to the f the first iteration of the internet. You know, we had American Online, and and we had uh, we had the, the first browser from Microsoft, and now the the biggest browser is probably Google. He says, I don't, I don't think the metaverse will be owned by anybody like Facebook or owned by Google. The metaverse will develop in the same way as the internet originally developed, as a great big collaboration across all sorts of different industries. So nobody should be trying to grab hold and say the metaverse is ours. The second one is that we should stop trying to cater for Gen Z or Gen Z, if you're watching this, if you're watching this from America, and millennials. Now, what what he's actually saying here, and I absolutely agree with this, is that there's a, a lot of companies saying we target Gen Z, we target millennials, and what Mark is saying here is that this gener these two generations of people don't like to become compartmentalized. But if you're saying we are targeting Gen Z and targeting millennials, then you are compartmentalizing them, and it's really just reinforcing something that I've, I've I've believed for a long time is that targeting an entire generation of people goes against marketing uh, marketing uh, philosophies. What you do is you segment that generation. You segment them into pe into segments of relevance. So if you've got a product which um, appeals to people like heavy metal music, then you're going to go and find the very few Gen Z people that like heavy metal. That probably wasn't a very good example, but you know what I mean. So again, there's this big trend that we should be targeting entire generations of people. And what Mark is saying, forget it, segment, target, and then do something for that specific mini segment. And you'll have a lot much better chance of being successful and of course his next one is nfts i think i'd spoken enough about nfts last week pascal but again mark is reinforcing what i said ultimately nfts are going to play a massive role in the future of e-commerce and the internet and the metaverse however it um comes together but at the moment it just seems to be driven purely by greed and i think that one day they'll find their place and it'll be a very important place but at the moment it just doesn't seem as if it's developed properly um the second one we're talking about the the, the next one we're talking about what he calls the cult of efficiency and th again this is this is the idea that we spend perhaps a little bit too much time being being planning and being obsessed with speed. And again, we, we live in a world now where we expect instant results. You know, somebody launches a podcast and they're disappointed after two episodes that they've not got a million listeners. And what he's saying here is that we're obsessed with this speed and that sometimes we just have to settle down and we have to slow down because things take time. And, you know, a salutary lesson, as you and I know, it takes more than a couple of episodes to get a successful podcast. It could take 10, it could take 100, it could take 200, depending upon your audience. The next one, virtual reality. And again, is what what he's saying here is there's some great tech out there, but most of it involves having to wear these gigantic goggles. And other than within the gaming sector, this again seems to be overhyped. People don't want to wear these gigantic goggles to go to meetings. They're quite happy to use Zoom or Teams. So again, he's saying that VR and AR haven't really found their their place yet. And no amount of hype will define where that place is until it actually turns up. And the last two is direct to consumer and sustainability. And this is an interesting one. It's not I've thought of before, but we've got a lot of these direct to consumer companies like HelloFresh, you know, where you can have a load of meals and ingredients for meals delivered direct to your door. Great idea on paper. But it's basically just having shopping delivered, isn't it? And, you know, you can subscribe to razor blades and have 
razor blades. You know, I, there's even a company in America called Me Undies where you can subscribe and have underwear delivered to you. And these are good ideas, they're business models that work, but what they actually also do is create a massive amount of additional packaging plastic packaging you know environmentally unfriendly packaging and i think what mark is saying is that by all means develop something direct to consumer but have a think about what you're actually packaging it in and let's let's not forget about the fact that this planet is uh, you know in a bit of trouble maybe and the final one is this whole idea of remote oblique hybrid working and and again the message here is that yes a lot of us most of us are working from home because of the pandemic but business models haven't really changed to take that into consideration we're still acting as if we're going to the office so there's still hundreds of useless meetings that last for hours and hours on end you know some people's diaries just meeting after meeting after meeting in a hybrid world we had the opportunity to completely reinvent working but what we've really just done is made the office environment go online and what mark's saying here is let's stop talking and celebrating remote hybrid work because we haven't really cracked it so those are the seven of mark's overhyped trends for 2022 what do you think i like the list a lot uh, i think it's back to this idea of the voice of reason you know the, speaking the truth that we've done we've had with mark ritson with uh, bob hoffman as part of our reviews on content spotlight which is that the the headlines and what's coming through the loudest is of course the hyped items and, and people sometimes are guilty of copying and pasting they have ghostwriters Nowadays, very sadly, they have AI, uh, you know, creating content on those subject matters. And, and I think back to um, how you know sometimes go back creating content. I can go through 20, 30 articles before I find the one I'm going to choose for a particular week because all the rest is is to hype stuff. Yes. And, and, I, and I think you're right. You know, Mark is not saying... Um, I don't like it and I want it to go away. What he's saying is all about timing. There's, mm. a, there's a place and the time to get enthusiastic and, or more importantly, adopt um, those different practices or, or technologies. Uh, and I think, um, I remember once he was on a radio show and it was all to do with the technology, it was all to do with digital. And he was a comedian, granted, who said, if you meet someone who works in IT, and they suddenly go on one, as he mentioned it. It's like listening to my nephew talking about his favorite dinosaur, which is that <laughs> it's so hyped, it's so bloated and, and kind of um, you know, full of hyperbole and jargon, but also the, the sheer excitement, which is that actually as a result of it, it's not, it's not credible. So we didn't have mentioned, to, mentioned it before, you know, the whole NFT, the AR, VR, so on, they need a new PR agent because the way and the manner in which they, they mention it and talk about it, it's really quite um, contrary to how you would run a business. I think where AR and VR have done very well, but again, it's very, very quiet. It's in the, uh, the training and simulation mm. mode, you know, around health, around military, around, I remember, demonstration by Google for people working on um, offshore and they're going to go into a very dangerous environment, you know, the oil rig, and they could really reenact the the first few hours on the oil rig and knowing where, you know, the, the safe paths were by using AR and VR. So there's a lot of wonderful application, but they are not talked about uh, ever, or they don't make the headlines, which is, I think is very, very unfortunate. Um, and that's what we try and do, I think, you know, with this podcast, Roger, is pick on what actually is sensible, and case in point, you and, you and I would have a meeting with, with a customer who would be asking us about AR and VR NFT, and we just say, but you've not even applied, you know, the strategy that we, we agreed uh, to a month ago. And it is human nature. I think you're not going to have mm. some sympathy with um, this idea of, you know, the new shiny objects. They are incredibly appealing. I, I'd be the first yep. one to, to admit to that. But actually, that's part of a skill you need to have as a leader and a business owner is to learn to ignore the marketing of marketing sometimes. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, so, approaches, I was going to say, I, because we don't speak to each other in preparation for, for the show, I myself chose an article from Fast Company, 
And I think that's only the second time it's, this has happened where we've chosen from the same source in 64 episodes. So this one, there's actually the timing is impeccable because I hosted a conference a few days ago and I was giving the opening address and I was kind of uh, mentioning that very, very soon the technology and the solutions to support a small business or even a larger one would be so easy to use and at such a low cost that the the promise in fact of the internet to create a level playing field will be will be met and therefore the only differentiator really would be those you have a clearer strategy and those you have a greater imagination about how to execute so this article, the title is Three Ways to Train Your Brain to Be More Curious. And the author is Art Markman, and as I mentioned, for Fast Company. Let me give you a quick biography of Art Markman, because I think that creates a lovely context. So he holds a PhD, he's a professor of psychology and marketing at the University of Texas in Austin. And he's also the author of a number of books, Smart Thinking, Habits of Leadership, Smart Change, Brain Briefs, and more recently, Bring Your Brain to Work. And I think in in regard to this article, he's having a minor, very implicit uh, attack on the technology, getting in the way of um, imagination and creative thinking, which as you know, is something that we've mentioned many times. And he's saying that really, if you recognize that creativity and engaging the brain and being curious is actually a very, very important talent and skill to to nurture. It's recommending three things that you can use to develop the habit to learn, almost akin to what you were like at a much younger age, where you were curious, asking questions, never settling for the first answers and that kind of things. So this article is brief in its own ways, but once again, the impact in terms of how it makes you think, how actually you can share it and move forward with it is very important. I also want to get your reaction in terms of what it means to use those three, those three tips in your work and, and mine. So tip number one, Mech lists, plural, you know, with an S at the end, mech list of things that you wish you understood better, want to know more of, you know, for a fact, will make a big difference. And and I think what he's saying is the list could be one for work, one for life, one for, for a hobby, but making a list is going to really give you that initial impetus to then be more curious and, and engage your brain. And is and is often the case, you and I've seen this ourselves, once you make the list, strange things tend to happen. The article reveals itself, you know, on, online. The um, you know, the, the TV show you listen to, the podcast you listen to, uh, will match. So once you make the list, you're then going to start to create, you know, that desire to learn. Then tip number two, make it easy to learn. And this is all about self-awareness. Do not make it a chore. Do not make it an appointment as if it's a, a business meeting. Ideally, which has been mentioned once again here, why don't you make the learning bit whilst you're cooking, whilst you're going for a walk? Maybe you are on the rowing machine. Perhaps you know, you're doing something else that doesn't require you full attention. And you can then put on a podcast. You could put an audio book. You could read. You could watch a um, you know, program on, on digital but really making sure that you use your own preferred style of learning as opposed to what may be imposed by others. The third one, which is one that I am so pleased was listed, is a buddy up. Try and find a way to have a pal who wants to be curious too, wants to maybe reconnect with the pleasure of learning and do it together. And what he was suggesting is why don't you, even if you can't, collaborate on the blog or whilst this is not what Art has mentioned, a podcast, Roger, where yes. with a body, you create that commitment, that, that motivation, and you keep the fun, which I think is a very, very important one. So three tips. Make the list of what you wish to learn and be more curious about. Find the ways to learn, number two. And number three, why don't you try and avoid being on your own, particularly this moment in time, and buddy up. And again, there's a few more bits and bobs of some lovely stories in the article, but I didn't want to steal the thunder from Art Markman. But for me, it's just this idea of we start in the year with some business objective, but could we have also some personal development or um, knowledge development objectives as well? 
This is so good. I mean, um, I love the idea of buddying up as well, because the fact that you and I do this podcast and the fact that we split it into the different sections means that we literally have to be curious to go out there to find the content to talk about. Uh, so we've, we're proof that this actually works. Um, what I also like is that illusion to the fact that young children will always question, won't they? they there's always never-ending stream of questions. Why is this? Why is that? How is that? What you know? It, the endless, endless curiosity of children. And somehow, eventually, and I don't know why, it may be part of the way that we do education in certain places across the world, we almost we almost beat the curiosity out of people, don't we? So that they no longer ask all of those questions. I remember way back, this is going back nearly 20 years now, Pascal, 2022. Um, so we're talking 2002, 2003. I was involved in a startup company in the financial services industry called Bright Grey. Always, always have a soft spot for that great brand name, Bright Grey. And somebody mentioned this whole thing about, you know, you always get the, the best questions from children. And I remember we actually did that when we got our products together. We, instead of taking them out to a focus group of customers, we also took them out to a focus group of children and actually got the children to ask us the most ridiculous questions, the most perceptive questions, the most unexpected questions. And that helped to shape the product going forward. And I think, you know, it's this is a timely reminder that we shouldn't lose our curiosity and our desire to find out things and the best way to find out things is to ask questions of course and, and for me it was back to as i was uh, reflecting on this article and i was so pleased about once again the timing is the conversation that i had two three days prior which is signed day of the dif differentiator will come from you have imagined a better campaign you have imagined a came up with a better solution but that comes from your exposure to, to you know the world around you and yeah. I suspect what Art Markman is warning people, this idea of it's all well and good to modernize things, all well and good to adopt new processes and practices, but not at the expense of your curiosity or, or this natural uh, desire to kind of not settle for just the facts in front of you, kind of go, but well, why, how, what, and all those wonderful questions. So I just thought, once again, the timing was impeccable. Shall we move on? then yeah. and slow things down with marketing tech and apps. So Roger, what have you found that can make life easier for marketers and content creators out there? Oh, well, this week, Pascal, I've been doing putting a few slides together for um, some upcoming trainings and presentations. And we've, we've mentioned on the show before sites like Pexels and Pixabay where you can download photographs, you can download videos and use those photographs and videos in your content. Um, but specifically, I needed some icons and some just something a bit different, some graphical um, illustrations for one of the training uh, courses that I'm putting together. And of course, on Pixabay and, and, Pe and um, Pexels, you tend not to find as much graphical stuff. So I, it it caused me to go being curious and going out there and trying to find stuff. And I came across a couple of websites which are actually quite interesting. So the first one is called DrawKit. So it's drawkit.com. And this is specifically about icons and graphics. Now, in PowerPoint and in Word for Windows, you do get graphics and you do get icons, but they're a bit they're a bit cheesy. They're a bit boring. And if you use them directly from PowerPoint or, or Word, it's likely that somebody else will have used them in their presentations as well. And, and you know, it, it's not original. So DrawKit has got some fabulous icons that you can use to illustrate and to build into your um, presentation. So have a look at that one. The next one, a similar site, but this takes it a little bit further. This site is called Free pings or free pngs and it's free png Im image .com. and again you've got photographs you've got emojis you've got 
um, you know, vector files of emojis so that you can have them big or small on your screen. They've got graphics. What I like about their photographs, Pascal, and again, you can find photographs of things like aeroplanes, dinosaurs, you mentioned dinosaurs before, or, or, or products. And because it's a PNG file, it's actually got no background, so that makes it perfect for putting into presentations. So if you're looking for stuff beyond photographs and beyond videos, try out these two websites because there's some good stuff on there. One slight word of warning, on the free pingimage.com uh, website, some of them you can only use in personal projects, not in commercial projects. But I, I think that means you've, you, you're you using them in a scenario where you're going to get paid f for that content. So I think that would be okay to use them in a presentation, but perhaps not use them if you were putting a video out there that was um, creating revenue. So just be careful. But most of them are free to be used. Super. Do you know, I'm so impressed that we continue to find new resources like this i mean you, yeah. you thought that after a year and a half it would be more of creating this uh, podcast series we've exhausted all the options but <laughs> every week with that fair we find new online resources to really help both in terms of um, feeling good about your content because you can make it as personal as you can and you're absolutely right um it reaches it reaches a point now where i don't know about you if i'm watching a presentation if i go online i now recognize the photos from pexels or the the, the graphics from from canva and it, there's nothing wrong with it but it may sometimes break the magic of or the immersion of that presentation yeah. so go elsewhere or as i always said to, to my customers if you go on pexels go on page five or yes. ten not on, on the first page. So this week, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to bend the rules slightly because I've got four, okay. four items to talk about, but they are groups in groups of two, so that's two, two uh, <laughs> elements. So the first one is Rode. The microphone manufacturers have been making a bit of a noise on the interweb for good reasons. They have very proudly launched their new Rode VideoMic Go 2. Now, am I right in thinking that you have the Rode VideoMic Go 1, or the, well, the first iteration of that microphone, for when you go no, out I don't. I, I, oh, no, right, I don't. No, I don't, actually, no. <laughs> which, one, which one do you use? I, I've actually got a, um, a remote microphone, which is part of the um, DJI um, Pocket 2 collection. Sure. So it's actually it's actually part of the camera kit but i have i have spoken about the uh, original video mic before i think i i may may have made it a a marketing tech feature way way back when i was actually thinking about buying one sure so only a few days ago um number two you know has been has been released and experts around you know the the globe as well as vloggers content creators are very very pleased with it it would seem although i've put the link to the official demonstration by road themselves what it is it's kind of potentially the microphone that can help you do podcasting video casting webinar hosting it, it kind of all in one because it can be affixed to a camera it can be affixed to a mobile to laptops and so on and it's also only 99 dollars. so then you can have mm. the, the equivalent so from the price range point of view but also from a in like a usability point of view it's just great because well you and i have had to buy different microphones for different purposes and i think that's just one worth mentioning and then they've remarketed the Rode Wireless Go 2. So this one being obviously where you have a, a receiver, a wireless receiver on the laptop, on the mobile phone or the camera, and you have obviously the wireless sender. But this one you have two, so you could have you and then interviewee, and you could be at a distance from, from the, the camera or the laptop or the mobile phone, and the sound would be, would be very clear. So that's the microphone solutions by Rode. Then you have your amazing recording, Roger. You have your audio production. What do you do with it? You've got to publish it online, of course, perhaps using Captivate.fm, who knows? But the one thing that I've discovered, again, through clicking on, on the number of articles, is that Amazon Music and Stitcher, two kind of podcast and, and audio content publishers, broadcasters, have an option for you to request for your podcast episode to be promoted for free as part of their kind of um, you know homepage 
uh, adverts would be a one to watch out for or featured or recommended type of things. So on the show notes, I've put the form to complete for Amazon Music. We so happened you and I to have been granted you know, the, the, the listing. But if we wanted to be on the homepage of Amazon Music as a recommended or one to watch out for, we could complete the form. And they would be really much, you know, um, name in a hat, I suppose. And then the same for Stitcher. There's a form there to complete where you can explain your show and the episode and why you should be considered. And if you're lucky, you will be on the homepage of the Stitcher web app as well as the website as a um, featured uh, content. So I thought it would be a nice one to let our viewers and listeners know about. That last one is really interesting. I, d I never knew you could do that, or at least I never knew you could do that for free. You would expect them to have monetized that in some way, and you have to pay a small fortune to appear on their front page. But the fact that you effectively apply to do it, and if, presumably if they accept you, it's free, well, that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So just sharing, obviously, what I'm thinking about, Roger, since you are a published author on Amazon, I thought maybe you could, do the Amazon Music um, request, online request. And since I am a Stitcher user, I'll do the Stitcher one, and we can report back to you know our audience what the result has been. Let's do it. <laughs> Excellent. Right. As we said before, many a time, none of this would be possible without the hard work and vision from pioneers of the recent and distant past. It is time to move on to This Week in History. In 1969, in Los Angeles, California, cult leader Charles Manson is convicted, along with followers Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, and Patricia Krenwinkel, of the brutal murders of actress Sharon Tate and six others. Wow. Well, in 1977, France launched its first operational solar power plant in the Pyrenees. Its original output was sufficient to power over 1,060 watt light bulbs. In 1983, the Lotus Development Corporation released Lotus 123 for IBM computers. While not the first spreadsheet program, Lotus was able to develop 123 because the creators of VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet, didn't patent their software. Ouch. Well, in 1998, Saving Private Ryan, directed by Steven Spielberg, is released. The film was nominated for 11 Oscars, Roger, and it won five. Best Director, the second one for Spielberg, Best Film Editing, Best Cinematography, Best Sound, and Best Sound Effects Editing, particularly for that early uh, session when they are on the beach of Normandy. So we've done the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s somehow <laughs> this week. <laughs> Which item particularly caught your attention? I was quite intrigued by this story about Lotus 1, 2, 3. I mean, what an absolute um, mistake that Visical made, the, the the creators of the first spreadsheet, not to patent the idea. I mean, imagine if they had patented it, then not only would Lotus not have been able to copy it, I presume that Excel, uh, Microsoft wouldn't have been able to do it as well, and the, the world would be a lot different. Obviously, they may have come up with a slight variation to escape the patent rules, but it just goes to show, doesn't it, that uh, you know if you invent something, you've got to protect yourself and... Visicalc obviously didn't. Um, funnily enough, I remember using Lotus 123 very early in my career. It was one of the first programs that I ever started playing with. And I guess at the time, I didn't even know it was a spreadsheet. It was just Lotus 123. Um, and we moved on to start using something called Lotus Notes quite um, soon after that, which was an email program. Um, but I think it's that whole idea of making sure that if you invent something that's different, then it's inevitable that somebody's going to want to copy it. So make sure that you protect yourself via patent, via copyright, whatever it is. Make sure that all the hard work you've put into it means that you keep the, uh, the intellectual property going forward. Uh, and that's true, just you know, to build on that, of anything you might invent, even as a consultant, or your kind of processes, your matrices, your, you know, your, your systems, you know, make sure they are protected and copyrighted and, and so on. Because uh, unfortunately, there are people out there who will not hesitate, as I've learned the hard way, to take your stuff and claim it to be their own. 
I mean, I remember learning Lotus 1, 2, 3 at university. We had IT, an IT course, and we had to demonstrate that we could do bar charts and pie charts on Lotus 1, 2, 3. And of course, once you went to work, they were using Excel, so you had to relearn. But it was, but it was very, very similar. Um, so my reflection, you know, that in the 90s then, if they'd done these things properly, I would have learned VisiCalc instead of Lotus 1, 2, 3. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, so I wanted to mention very quickly this idea of the first operational solar power plant in France, 1977, which feels mm. a long time ago in itself. But I was applying the rules mentioned by Art Markman. I became curious about it, thinking, well, where is it and what does it do and so on? And there's a fascinating story. Now, to begin with, it was uh, the construction really began just after the Second World War. And I thought, well, what have they been doing for 30 years? Well, to begin with, this was invented as a weapon. Oof. So what they were trying to do in 47, which um, literally blew my mind, was trying to capture, obviously, the power of the sun and then literally beam the sun rays back onto German aircraft to literally try and, if not blind, the pilots actually melt the metal because it could create um, temperatures that I should have memorized or written down the, the value that would literally damage damage the aircraft. Now, of course, um, they didn't have to d do that. So they thought, well, what do we do with the, the, what we've, we've built? So they then trying to switch it to becoming a solar power plant. But the history was not a happy one. When they did the very first test, I'm assuming with dignitaries and whatever, the power output was one watt. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a way to impress people, but uh, hopefully they managed to convince them to allow them to try a bit longer until they could create, obviously, more power. And they were able in, in 1977 to um, plug it into actually the, the grid and offer some additional additional power. But I was thinking about this, you know, about solar power, because it is really the one that has the least amount of waste and negative impact on you know, the climate. But it... it to me, and maybe I, I'm misinformed, it doesn't feel like it's become the, the go-to solution. It's not the norm. You know, we don't see solar power um, kind of output devices everywhere. You know, I remember uh, people saying to me one day, every single kind of roof tiles, anything that has a roof will have a form of, you know, kind of solar capture. But it's, it's not really happening, and I'm not sure whether, you know, there's something I need to look into. Um, but I just thought it was a fascinating story that what started as, as a weapon has become far more useful. Yeah, I, I guess the reason we don't have so much solar power in the UK is because <laughs> it only it's only sunny about two days a year, isn't it? But uh, um, they, they always say that in Scotland, um, summer is the best day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the, the Pyrenees has always fascinated me, Pascal. You know, it, it, when I was growing up, my parents took us to Spain every year with the, uh, Menorca in the Balearic Bal Islands. And so it was always one of my favorite parts of the flight was flying over the the Pyrenees they just looked so incredible uh, yeah. some of sometimes they were snow capped sometimes they weren't but they always looked really sort of quite jagged and scary and I always thought I'd love to actually get be down there and and and, and actually exploring the Pyrenees oh, you, it's something you, you I've must. never actually done yeah have you ever had the the pleasure of flying over the Pyrenees at sunset possibly I mean, we, we've, I mean we've done that, that trip something. loads of times yeah mm. no must but that's Got to be on the bucket list, that has. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, let's get back into the present, Roger, if you don't mind, with our creator shout-outs. Yeah. So, Roger, who have you chosen for today's Spotlight? Well, Pascal, I don't know how I managed to do this, but on my computer, on my desktop computer, Spotify now boots up with the I must have clicked a button you know the startup menu or something like that so every time I start my computer the first thing that pops up on the screen is now Spotify um, and that's not a problem because I do listen, listen to music on Spotify quite a lot um, but I was looking for I, I think I haven't mentioned this before um, Christmas but I basically unsubscribed from pretty much every single podcast that I've been listening to for the last decade and decided to start looking for different um, podcasts to listen to and I was I was looking for this week for podcasts about how to be a better speaker how to be a better presenter and I actually came across on Spotify 
um, a podcast which is actually called Be a Better Speaker. I mean, how simple can that be? And, and the podcast is by, now the actual podcast itself just says Be a Better Speaker podcast with Graham. Now, you actually have to listen to the podcast to find out that his full name is, Dave, is Graham David. Now, I don't know about you, Pascal, but I've listened to quite a few podcasts about speaking and quite often they're they're really quite shouty podcasts and 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 there's a lot of you if you want to smash it if you want to really not knock it in knock it out the park if you want to blitz it like and it and and sometimes think oh for goodness sake just (laughs) give me the tips you know let let this guy is a lot more reserved and maybe slightly analytical but i really like his style now i've since discovered when i put this on the list and i've listened to about four or five episodes and you know there's there's some obvious stuff in there that you and i it wouldn't surprise you and i because we have done a lot of public speaking but he's also got some interesting angles on storytelling interesting angles on use of slides and that sort of thing so i have learned quite a bit but i was actually quite disappointed to notice today when spotify booted up and of course because i've been listening to it this podcast takes pride of place in the recently listened to category that he hasn't actually put an episode out since the middle of 2019 so there are only 34 episodes there which isn't bad and most of them are between 10 and 15 minutes long so it's quite bingeable and maybe um he's had to move on to other things as a result of the pandemic or whatever but he's worth listening to so 34 episodes here maybe he'll come back and do some more Sure, and to your point, recency is not necessarily uh, indication of quality or, or whichever. No. You know, you, you should be listening to things from the past and read books that were published many, many years ago. But thanks for that. I think it's a wonderful addition to the creator's shoutouts. Now, for me, this is a return. Actually, this is a second shoutout before different reasons, and. I would say it's sheer luck that I managed to get the link between the content spotlights and the creator's shoutouts, this idea of being curious. I want to let you know about Andy Storch, who we met, as you know, at the Upreneur Summit, business and productivity consultant, speaker, and author of Own Your Career, but he's also the host of a newly published podcast series called My NFT Journey. And this is just delightful. This is exactly what we talk about, Roger, as opposed to, you know, the kind of uh, overwrite kind of content telling you that if you're not doing it now, you're missing out. Andy is just going to be curious and is curious and he's just trying things out. He's talking to people as well. He's got some interviews. He's reacting to the news and he's just sharing as you would have done back in the days of blogs you know the way they were created and sharing his findings and considerations and you need to therefore follow him and take your time with it and i think that this aspiration that by reading a bombastic article once you understand everything there is to to know or that you should jump in i think this is exactly what you're saying a moment ago just something considered something that is, is clear is simple but takes time And I wanted to kind of thank him for taking the time not only to go through his own NFT journey, but to document it. And I think that is just what we need at this moment in time. So once again, big thank you to Andy and welcome back to the Creator's Shoutouts. Yeah, I've listened to the show as well, Pascal, um, and obviously met Andy at Youpreneur Summit as well. And I think... You know, I've ranted about NFTs on this show several times now, and there are some people out there who it's perfectly obvious it's just about greed and it's just about jumping onto the latest bandwagon. Um, It's clear that Andy is extremely excited and um, interested by NFTs, but he's not in that category of somebody who is just out there shouting about it, latest trend, becoming an NFT guru or NFT ninja or whatever it is. As you say, it's a considered approach, and that's what we need. That's what we need. We need to look beyond the bombast. We need to look beyond the hype, and that is exactly what Andy's doing. That's why, if there's anything said about NFTs, it will probably I will probably gravitate to people like Andy because the rest of it is is just bombast and hype. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, everyone, we have reached that segment that Roger and I always look forward to marketing. 
Now, Roger, from time to time, there is a film that gets everybody excited and everybody in agreement about how amazing and what a success it is. Critics, moviegoers, filmmakers, media companies galore got behind Doc Soldiers 20 years ago. Let's watch the trailer again. I had a cracking story about this place. The young couple were hiking through these woods. During the night, something happened. I mean, I I went to the movies to see this on the basis of an article in a magazine I used to buy all the time called Total Film. And Neil Marshall, the director and the writer, had been featured. It was like pages upon pages of content about the movie. But it was mostly about the making of the movie. There was not so much about the story, so there was no spoilers. And when I sat there in the cinema in Newcastle with, uh, with Denise, and we left thinking, this was brilliant. Do you remember watching Doc Soldiers 20 years ago? Yes, and again, do you know one of the things that really makes this movie for me is that they take the time to carefully get you to like the characters at the start. There's quite a lot of character building, isn't there? There's, there's an incredible scene early on in the film where Sean Pertwee tells a story about something that happened in Iraq, and it's quite a gruesome story, but it doesn't half bond all of those soldiers together and you learn about them and you and you start to like them so that when it all starts kicking off later when they all start getting attacked and some of them unfortunately die you really feel it and and sometimes films don't do that do they I, i've watched quite a lot of films recently where i just don't care about the characters so when they come to a grisly end it's almost like okay fine but this one you know the 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 writing was so good that within minutes you felt like you knew these characters inside out and that is a remarkable bit of writing and a remarkable bit of filming i, I would agree you know there was a, very very quickly you're absolutely right there was this idea of i want those that group to do well and, and survive yeah. there's also a number of individuals actually not just the werewolves that i disliked very quickly and yeah. I want you and a number of others to, to not make it. And your your commitment and, and the way in which you invest in the story is outstanding. But you mentioned the writing that we do know because of Colonel Marshall has been very, very open and, and actually very generous with the information. Because I think for me, it was at the time where I was really getting into this discovery and journey of discovery around filmmaking and particularly indie production. He wrote the first draft in ninety six just, you know, quite some, some years later, and kept refining it and kept talking to people and, of course, putting together the, the financing and, and the, the cast and crew. And with that, I think maybe there's a lesson, which is it may take time for you to get to the final product. Ab absolutely right. I mean, he stuck at it, didn't he? And, and he had this vision, again, which is always very important. He didn't want to do a classic werewolf film. Now, if you actually think about it, and I didn't really think about it until we did some research for this particular film, but a lot of werewolf films of the past, and things like An American Werewolf in London, they tend to focus on the individual who has become infected and will then transform when the, the, the full moon comes up. Um, and he didn't want to make another film which was very much in that sort of, oh, isn't it? a shame about the person who's been infected he just wanted an all out almost like aliens with werewolves didn't he? he just wanted a group of people 
base under siege sort of thing, stuck in stuck in a house in the middle of nowhere with all these creatures um, around surrounding them, and and build the the drama out of that scenario, and and it obviously took time to get there. And the lesson that we can all learn, as you've said, from our marketing, from our product development, is you know by all means, you know, keep developing something, but don't feel that the first iteration absolutely has to be the one that you put out there. Refine it until it becomes perfect. Well, maybe not perfect. We will never get to perfect, but refine it a few times so that it matures. For me, it was clear, it's only from the, the cast point of view, and I was six by therefore by the crew, that they were committed to telling the story. They were committed to the audience for us to mm. have a brilliant time uh, in terms of the story structure, we can say it was superbly filmed, bear in mind you know, the resources they had. Once again, you really care for the characters. We're going to speak in a moment about how they went about creating the werewolves and how very different they are to other films. Uh, interestingly, there's the second werewolf movie that we reviewed on the <laughs> Marketing Podcast. For me, it is clear, and from the interviews, but also actually from the film itself, I mean, this sits on my bookshelf, uh, DVD shelf, alongside Doomsday, The Descent, and Centurion. And it, it's the idea of Neil Marshall loves film. And in this one, there are references if you want to see them, but they're not distracting. So you mentioned mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that monologue from Sean Pertwee around the campfire. For me, is uh, Neil Marshall's Joe's moment when we had yes. the monologue from Bernard Shaw. And if you've not seen Doc Soldiers, I'll say no more. But you know, there is a scary bit in there as well, and the story just takes a, a turn, very much like we'd expect in, in in a film. You have reference to aliens. You have reference, although he said he, it wasn't meant to be to the Matrix. You have reference for me the way in which you know they have to try and stay safe inside the the cabin to Night of the Living Dead or Assault on Precinct 13. You've got all that going on, but it's almost its own celebration of cinema as Neil Marshall has lived it, but also creating a story that is unique. And the reason why I think the media in particular has gone behind it is a sense of pride. And actually, internationally, this is called the UK Werewolf Movie. It's become the, its own little mm -hmm. mini brand. Yeah, absolutely, and and it didn't actually get a cinema release in the states, did it? They it went straight to straight to um, VHS at the time, um, and that that's uh, you know that, that's a criminal act, isn't it? It's such a good movie; you really do need to in, um, experience it on the big screen. But uh, it, like a lot of movies of this kind, it has created a bigger following over time. And, and of course, when it was released initially on VHS and then DVD, and now there's a 4K version out there as well, that the following, it, it, it's achieved more than cult status now. What is absolutely fascinating is this is a movie that is talked about on a regular basis. If you go on YouTube just as, as a barometer, the, over the last 20 years, people have done reviews, have done um, you know even fan-made trailers using snippets from the movie. So the movie is talked about by the, the audience in a manner that is just quite quite extraordinary. We know because, of course, uh, it, it was documented that Marshall was very disappointed by the lack of cinematic release in the US. He got a proper release in the UK because we went, mm. I'd imagine, the rest of, of Europe. We've seen that with Highlander. Do you remember with Highlander? There, there, there was just that nervousness and hesitation in, in the yeah. US market. But for, for the people who could watch it, I think it was on Sci-Fi Channel that, that, that could watch it. The US movie lovers you know, went behind it and created, therefore, the word-of-mouth marketing and PR they would expect. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, it's the other thing that is remarkable about this is how much they achieved on such a low budget. Um, I mean, there was no CGI as far as I can... Um, well, I think they tried some tests with CGI, but it was probably in, in its infancy and, and it just didn't look good. Um, they didn't have the budget to create the transformation effects from human to werewolf that you saw in the likes of American Werewolf in London. So they actually had to resort to what sounds like the old style cheesy 
transformation where literally the the character maybe they put some um, uh, contact lenses over their eyes to make their eyes go yellow and then they curl up and start making a lot of noise and then they fall down behind a chair or behind a table and then they get up and they've transformed i mean it, it, that sounds so utterly cheesy and cheap doesn't it but he pulls it off so well that you don't even notice and i think that's absolutely key to the fact that this was so well made that even by doing that they got away with it and made it look really impressive yeah because again we are invested as an audience it, it pays off I, I, i'll make another link with joe's but um when steven spill was saying but you know your, your shark is looks rubbish man you know, it's rubber it doesn't move yeah. properly and so on but he was saying but by then by the time the sharks is revealed the audience is with us and i think that was the case there with dog soldiers but when the, the werewolves are, are revealed Again, a commitment in terms of Neil Marshall's story and being a bit different, he uh, a used real kind of um, you know practical special effects of people were wearing the 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 outfits that look great, and he also used dancers. So he wanted them to yes. move in a way that felt uh, again very very different. Yeah, absolutely, and and. Uh, I- you you get very quick shots, don't you, Pascal? You know they don't linger too much, and that's probably again a good thing. Just like the, in Jaws, as you say, you get the glimpses until t- right towards the end when you actually get to see them on screen for longer. Um, and and I think the dancers really made them a little bit weird as well. The movement was mm. not what you expect, and I think that again just added to the to the atmosphere uh, it, it what well, the other thing that i was interested in is that um we nearly got jason statham in this film uh, yeah. apparently he was he was originally going to be playing the role of cooper who's the main the main um, hero of the show i guess uh, but he couldn't actually do it he had a prior commitment to go to the states to work with john carpenter so so we got uh, the 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 actor who who plays cooper instead but um again great acting um i think that sean pertwee is one of the our most underrated actors and his performance in this is just superb absolutely superb um he's got humor he's got timing he's got melancholy he's got energy i really do think he's he's um underrated so a couple of things i wanted to mention about the um the, the marketing now it is, you know, of the nature of an indie production sometimes to have limitations or for things to be taken off your hand by the distributors and so on. But there was certainly a strong artwork that was mm-hmm. shared in terms of the posters, eventually the DVD covers and so on. Then people have been messing on over the years. But for me, the original artwork is, is the best. It's the one where you have a soldier that is backlit by, we suspect, a full moon and the shadow has the shape of a werewolf and you have well the um the caption six men full moon no chance which always makes me smile and then you have a quote and five stars from a review a bitch of a werewolf movie and you put that out in terms of posters and dvd covers and you are truly on your way to festivals and film markets yeah, and one of the other posters quotes as well is Jaws, Aliens, and Predator with a werewolf twist. I mean, you're name dropping three incredible action movies there and suspense movies, and you know you, you're going to draw people in just by using that tagline. One of the things I was very interested in when we watched the trailer again there is the the, the trailers almost poking fun at the audience a little bit because yes it's got this montage of shots so you see glimpses of the werewolves you see the soldiers in action um but there's there's captions at the bottom saying there are six people trapped in the house which one of them will lose their nerve first and and it's almost like a little extra game that's going on yeah in the trailer and then at the end it says hands up if you um predicted it was going to be the woman don't be so sexist and oh that that's interesting i've never actually seen that happen in a in a trailer before you know that was almost in addition to the the information we were getting about the movie that the they were almost having a, a bit of a laugh with the audience there indeed and, and the throp line you mentioned a moment ago it, it's sometimes used actually to mislead an audience but in this one it was true all mm. those amazing references and all those amazing adventure movies that we've all kind of um, had you know great memories 
have been are there as part of an inspiration. I mean, he himself, you know, was thinking, I want to recreate almost, you know, that feeling of in Zulu where they are completely outnumbered and, and how yeah. would you survive? And it's almost what happens as much as, uh, again, th- there's a wonderful kind of uh, juxtaposition between the gory, scary elements and the, the humor. Some of the one-liners are absolutely uh, amazing. But this idea of, yeah, what would I do in, in, in that situation? And, and you know, we've talked about the poster. We've talked about the um, the trailer. I absolutely love the poster cover for the 4K release. The 4K release is, is, is quite recent in the, in the last couple of years, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit comic booky in my mind, but it's absolutely beautiful. But there's even a story about the release of, of the DVDs and the Blu-rays because, you know, we were saying before about um, protecting your assets and things like that and patents, but they actually lost the original negative for this film after it had been released. And when it came time to re- to release it on Blu-ray and DVD, they really didn't have a decent copy that could cope with the uh, quality that 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 uh, a Blu-ray could bring. Um, and eventually they did find a 35 millimeter decent copy of the film from which they created the Blu-ray. But to, in order to launch the 4K version, for which you need an absolutely pristine negative, they they were really in trouble until somebody actually managed to find the negative. And from that, they were then able to launch the 4k version and i just i found an interview with neil marshall when he was describing this and he was saying it was like looking for the lost ark of the covenant (laughs) i think it was buried in the well of souls somewhere nobody knew where the negative was which was just a terrifying thought that low you know for a low uh, for an independent filmmaker that they'd lost the negative but then about a year later the producer contacted me and say i found it i found the neg and there it was that they were then able to launch the the 4k version it's scary that things like this could get lost it, it's just mm. like you know staggering that people are not uh, organized well enough or maybe there's a storage issue but to lose something like this seems um so inappropriate and, <laughs> and crazy but um i'm so pleased that he found it and, and and i think if we could take our mind back to 2002 so we mentioned the coverage, particularly in print media, was quite something for a mm. film that, frankly, belongs to the low budget, you know, era. is also very, very British and so on. And I think we should that. And I'm sure it was great for the the cast and crew, for Neil Marshall, anybody else, to get recognition at the Brussels International Film yes. Festival, Fantasy Film Festival. That at that time, the president was no other than Christopher Lee. And you know they, they won the, the the award there for best film. That's just a nice nod and recognition from your peers. That perhaps was needed after what would have been for Neil Marshall six seven years of hard graft. You're absolutely right. I mean, I love the fact that Christopher Lee was the uh, <laughs> was the president at the time. That's fantastic. But yeah, this is you know again, this is one of those films that a lot of people will never have heard of. Um, they might, you know, they might dismiss it because it's a, you know, it's just another werewolf movie. But this is more than a werewolf movie. This, you know, we've, we, the fact that we've compared it to Jaws on many occasions, it is great acting, great writing, great filmmaking, and the tension is palpable. So if you haven't seen this, please go and find that glorious 4K disc with its glorious cover and give this a watch with the lights turned down. Indeed, and I'll finish with um, a bit of news, which I think you know already. Neil Marshall is indeed in talks with many others for a sequel, so that would be just absolutely delightful. Right, everybody, this was episode 64. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. And thank you to you, Roger, for being such an amazing co-host. Until the next one, go out there and make sure your marketing is done right. I was Pascal Fintoni and he was Roger Edwards. Roger Edwards.